Yes, thank you, Matia. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Mary Emanuel. I work at the Economic and Strategic Analysis team in NHS ENI, and I am one of the co-founders of the NHS Python community. I wanted to first just start by contextualising actually what these communities are, are trying to do and what this open source show and tell is actually trying to achieve. So to start, the NHS Python community is a community of practice that champions the use of Python and open co code in, in the NHS. Python is actually the most popular programming language in the world. And one of the reasons why it's so popular, you know, amongst being very good at a lot of things is because it's an open source tool, which means it's free to use and free to distribute. You can freely distribute the code. And that's something that R and Python both have. But the value, I argue, of open source in the NHS uh, goes actually beyond languages, beyond tools. And it's actually about the culture that being open can bring. So the culture of being open, um, sharing and, and collaboration. I think that is where the real value of open source can be found in the NHS. And so NHS Python community, NHS R, we came together because we understand there is so much amazing work going on in the NHS to do with open code that nobody knows about. And there's also a lot of people who want to learn how to code, who want to publish projects, but don't know where to start. Like, what is the first step? So we want to create this, um, this kind of event to kind of bridge the gap between the um, inspirational, the people who are making amazing projects, and you'll kind of hear from them today, who should have their work recognised, and also the inspired, who are people probably like you, who kind of want to get into this, who will hopefully share these projects, learn, build on them, improve on them, and actually use them to solve uh, the most pertinent important questions in the NHS. So that's kind of uh, the NHS Python community open open comments. Anastasia, did you have any comments you wanted to make? Well, after such inspirational speech, I'm, I'm not sure actually, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, just to uh, highlight about NHS our community and its history as well. Uh, so hi, my name is Anastasia and I used to be project manager for the our community, but I left this role back in September, so I feel a bit like imposter talking about this right now. Um, how NHS our community is an amazing, uh, it's, it's a community um, and right. it was created by um, Mohammed Mohammed, who uh, some of you might know, and was funded by Health Foundation. Um, so, and currently being hosted by Strategy Unit. So I can see quite a few familiar faces on the line now. Um, it's main aim to support learning and application of R. Uh, so very similar to uh, NHS PyCom, we feel like R is being unutilized. It's free. It's amazing. It supports reproducible analysis, and as a result, NHS community is doing a lot uh, to support its use. Uh, so we have trainings, we have annual conference, uh, we have Slack workspace with very um, good variety of channels for all. Uh, types of our users. I, th I think you, uh, Marin and I will share a few links with you in the chat uh, later today as well, so you can join us all. Um, so yeah, and I think, and then without further ado, I think I uh, actually hand it all back to Matia or straight to our speaker. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're going to hand it back over to me. Um, so thank you so much, Marion and Stasia. That was a really great um, summary of both um, NHS PyCom and NHSR. So I'm just going to say this again. Um, so during the talks, please, everyone, um, you know, keep your mics turned off um, and drop any questions you have for the speakers into the chat. And I'll be then giving uh, those questions and trying to collate them in the best way possible to the speakers um, at the end of their talks. So uh, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our first uh, two speakers who are going to talk about the reproducible analytical pipelines at Energist Digital and the community of practice which they formed about uh, around these reproducible analytical pipelines. Um, this is a Python based project and the speakers are both uh, senior data scientists at, at NHS Digital and they are Helen Richardson and Kenneth Kwan. So um, yeah, could you uh, please uh, start sharing your presentation and I'll let you take it from um, here, um, Helen and Kenneth, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mattia. I'm going to uh, share my screen and please let me know if that is successful. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Awesome. So hello, I'm uh, Helen. So and me and Ken, we're part of um, a team of data scientists at Angus Digital. 
and one of the uh, projects we're working on aims to roll up RAP across the organization. Uh, reproducible analytical pipelines, or RAP, as put by the Government Statistical Service, are automated statistical and analytical processes, and they incorporate um, elements of software engineering best practice to ensure that the pipelines are reproducible, auditable, efficient, and high quality. Engine Digital is a very large organization with multiple directorates and disciplines, so there was and is a real challenge of embedding RAP practices across the organization. So we have pulled a few slides here that cover the key points that helped our RAP cause and lessons learned from the RAP rollout in Engine Digital. So one of the, the most important things we have done is to very directly tie RAP back to our um, organizational strategy. Our leadership team are tasked with delivering the strategy, but they are often non-technical. And this means that it falls to us. It means that it falls to us to explain very clearly how and why RAP is such an important element in delivering these goals. Um, we have spent a lot of time engaging upwards and, and this has a big impact in terms of getting us the resources we need to bring this work forward, but also makes it more likely for teams we work with to get the, that defended time to be able to focus on RAP. So a shout out here, what we really like and we really appreciate this report from the, the Office for Statistics Regulation on the barriers to adopting RAP. In the past few months of pursuing RAP work at Anxious Digital, we have encountered nearly every one of the um, the barriers that, have, that are listed in this report and the solutions that the report recommends have been helpful in every case. And uh, many of the activities that I'll talk about in the next few slides originated from reading and talking about this paper. And I would also encourage you all to have to to go through this report and then have a read and why not perhaps um, share the findings with your senior managers and, and stakeholders. So one of our biggest successes has been to agree to a process uh, for Anxious Digital to share code publicly. Anxious Digital, um, we host a, an internal GitLab instance where our code is version controlled. The benefit of this internal hosting is that it reduces the likelihood of any sort of accidental data leaks. However, Hosting our code in internally makes it very difficult for anyone to access it and to have sort of any sights of how the analytical teams are working. And so Anxious Digital is extremely protective of patient data. And so in order to convince our leadership team to allow us to put code in the open, we try to address the concerns with, um, about security head on. And we have designed a review and sign off process that teams need to complete before they can release the, um, the code publicly, and we are using GitHub for sharing code in the open. And this process, it requires both internal and external code reviews to ensure nothing risky is included in said GitHub um, repository. Now, the second benefit that comes from this, from this move, is that for the first time, um, and it's just digital teams can see each other's work. And we have already seen that many teams are recreating the same types of functionality, for example, uh, code for data ch uh, quality checks. By putting these processes out there for everyone to be able to see them, we can start identifying common parts of publication code and then make those uh, reusable. If there are any other departments on this call that are having similar issues, then please get in touch and we're very happy to share our approach on uh, publishing code. So, so this map here, so this is what we call the RAP maturity map or maturity levels or maturity ladder. One of the challenges we face is that many of the teams at Anxious Digital are completely new to Python. And for teams who are learning to use Python, this is a real opportunity for them to set off, to set them off on the right path on um, by embedding RAP practices from the start. On the other hand, there can be a risk of sort of discouraging teams if we ask them to go too fast too soon. For example, we did have a situation where a non-technical stakeholder was insistent that everyone from the team should be trained from zero, from zero to 100 to basically an expert Python user in a short amount of time, which is impossible. And to help with this, we have laid out this RAP maturity model. 
that sets out um, a sequence for teams to tackle the difference, the, the different rare practices. And our goal here is to set teams off on the right track, but also to help them identify the areas which have sort of the best impact to effort ratio. And once these, uh, once our analytical teams have started the journey through these rep maturity levels, then they can decide which sort of uh, level to attack to to tackle um, next on the maturity ladder uh, ladder at whatever point suits them, um, based on um, their own requirements and and needs. We have also spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to best support teams engaged with rep. We have now tried out three different models of engagement. The first one, we basically merged fully with the team. So you have the rap team here in black and the team we were supporting in white. We led on the planning and development and design with the team being mentored alongside us. That worked really well. The analyst team got very good training and we had a chance to get our hands on some code and figure out what types of processes were required. The problem with this approach is that it's very resource intensive. We would expect the rep team to sort of be embedded with the with the other team for at least a couple of months, but then we would. But then when we have a hunt with hundreds of publications and many analytical teams, this won't scale well. The second approach we tried was to work with a team of mixed stability, giving them control of the development process and with us offering on demand support. So the benefit of this approach is that the the analyst team, they really get the chance to grapple with the code. And as a result, they I think they have learned more effectively. But the problem with this approach is that without much without much guidance from us, the rap team, they have struggled to design the next stages of the work to really sort of like a higher quality. We've done input sessions with them on refactoring code, um, making better use of functions and offering code review sessions, but the dynamic has been a bit more difficult to manage, particularly with a mixture of sort of like high and low Python skills. The thing that worked best here is that we had a pair coding support, sort of like a coding buddy system. And this is because it allowed us to manage the sort of very different Python skill level in the team of, of analysts more effectively. So the third approach we used was to basically identify a highly skilled individual and the analyst team who wanted to lead on the development work. And then we focus on our efforts on supporting the uh, said individual. And this has been a very effective approach from the perspective of our team, as it is easier to manage and it's less resource intensive. Um, we find we can make faster progress towards a stronger sort of code outcome, but there is a risk of leaving the rest of the analyst team behind. And the other problem with this approach is that it depends on teams already having a skilled individual. Our current thinking is to improve on this third option by thinking about developing sort of like wrap pipelines and training teams as two sort of different, two distinct services that we might provide. Um, overall, though, this process of figuring out what works, uh, what works best depends on like a team by team basis. So finally, perhaps the most, um, this is perhaps the most important work of, of, of what we've done um, so far is basically building this, the RAP community of practice, which is available on GitHub. We have worked um, alongside teams to understand their pain points, but instead of fixing those pain points at once, we instead try to figure out something that is reusable, a reusable solution. And sometimes this means producing some guidance videos that walk, uh, walk analysts through a workflow, through the problem and how to solve it. Um, other times, this means that we might develop some reusable code templates, um, some data quality sort of code checks, and then the team can adapt for their own needs. In each case, um, we can make these resources available on the RAP community of practice page. And we basically, we're not trying to replicate general tutorials that you can easily find online, but instead we have provided guidance that is sort of tailored to NHS Digital along with links to other resources. And an important part of this is that we keep improving the materials by asking teams to use them and receiving feedback. And I will now pass on to Kin, who will talk us through the RAP community of practice.
Cool. Thanks, Helen. So a bit about myself. I'm uh, Kin and I'm a data scientist at, N at NHS Digital. And for in this talk, I'm going to, I pasted a link uh, referring to the uh, RAP community of practice on on GitLab. So just give me one second whilst I share my screen. Helen, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. So this is the uh, RAP community of practice. It's available to, uh, to the general public by this uh, Git, uh, GitHub link, which I've sent in the chat. And the purpose of this uh, repo is essentially twofold. The first is to uh, is to be used as a training material to migrate people who may be using SAS uh, in to be uh, to be used in uh, Python and to use Python well. And the second uh, purpose of this repo is essentially a, um, a a set of reference material for people within the organization and outside uh, in the NHS ecosystem to uh, to learn and to um, uh, to learn and to produce uh, their work uh, to uh, wrap principles. So the repo contains uh, three aspects. First of all, uh, best practices in develop in developing uh, Python code uh, to uh, wrap principles. The second is to develop uh, the best practices to organize and deliver uh, Python code. And finally, I'm going to talk about um, best practices in formatting uh, PySpark code. So first of all, let's go into the uh, development approach. So I'm just going to give you some uh, brush strokes uh, introdu uh, introduction to these uh, learning materials. So in the development approach, we've placed some art, uh, placed a series of articles about the best work practices in a team in order to create uh, in, in order to create and maintain Python code uh, to uh, to the reproducible analytical uh, pipeline or wrap standards. So they contain articles about introduction to Git and version control, uh, how to structure the data, the data in a uh, tidy uh, data uh, format, and as well as uh, guidance and code review. So in each of these articles, we're going to look at the introduction to Git. It in all of these articles, we provide a both a overview and a motivation uh, of why you should use uh, Git and version control, as well as as well as uh, detailed instructions uh, in order to uh, produce uh, basic commands in Git and step by step, step uh, instructions in order to set up uh, a Git uh, repository. The second uh, uh, the second set of uh, articles uh, contains about uh, Python, so these are the uh, best practices in order to organize and deliver uh, to deliver uh, Python code. So in here it contains information about how to structure your Python code as well as, for example, how to create and maintain a, uh, a virtual uh, Python environment. So in these articles, uh, in, in these articles, again, we give a good introduction and motivation of why uh, we should use uh, we should structure in a specific uh, way, in, in this case, uh, in terms of a uh, package. We give uh, clear instructions of how to organize uh, uh, organize uh, your Python code as organize your Python code, as well as further down in the article, we give uh, further guidance of how to put add-ons to fe uh, add-on features into our uh, package. So for example, in this case, uh, adding features such as uh, such as unit testing. And finally, with developing technologies, we've also put some um, articles regarding uh, about the best uh, best way to use a uh, PySpark code. So in this article, we have a uh, PySpark style guide, which gives uh, best, uh, best best practices in order to uh, share in order to produce and share uh, Py, uh, Py, uh, PySpark code. So for example, uh, here, how do we uh, import functions, how to sh structure a select statement, and examples such as uh, produced in uh, ag aggregations, as and and as well as um, method uh, method chaining. So all of these articles are available for both our intern uh, for our internal analysts as well as the uh, as well as ex as well as the uh, general public. 
Um, so we welcome uh, we welcome uh, feedback as well as uh, general ideas, and um, we place a uh, contact link here um, here uh, to accept uh, feedback and and recommendations. So that's uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, happy to uh, give to the floor to uh, for any um, for any suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Helen and, and Kenneth. That's absolutely brilliant work and amazing job that you've done, um, kind of setting up a full community around us. So um, uh, we have some a few questions in chats. Um, the first one is from Matthew Locke, who asks, "Would you recommend version controlling SQL scripts and analytics teams too?" Yes, um, uh, ver version control it ca is applicable to both Python, SQL, R, uh, MATLAB. If you're brave, uh, uh, if um, uh, any any codes, and if if you're new to um, version control, um, we uh, look into our uh, community practice, and we'll give you and it will give you an introduction to the um, uh, to get. Um, uh, to get version control, and just to mention that you can get free licenses on GitHub, uh, uh, free licenses on GitHub in order to uh, perform uh, version control. Although you would need to consult your own organization about what what can and can't be put up. For example, sensitive uh, sensitive uh, patient specific data or uh, uh, se uh, sensitive uh, information. Yeah. Great. Yeah, great. I agree with that completely. Um, the second question is from Mark Bailey, and he asks, how do you allow people to give feedback on this work in Code Online? Is there some sort of registration barrier to be able to give feedback? Yeah, I think practice. Um, do you mean feedback on the community of, of practice? Um, I, th I think from the question, it, it's more about the, the like comments on the code itself. Uh, Helen, uh, I think you're the best place to answer this. So, so we do have we do encourage teams to do code reviews, and we that is one of the barriers we have faced with basically analysts. They don't like it when you want to sort of talk about their code and <laughs> potentially make any sort of corrections to the code or sort of advice for like a code style or some kind of best practices. And what we're trying to encourage is we we're basically trying to doing sort of like interactive demonstrations of how to do constructive and nice code review without basically showing that it's a safe sort of process to do and it's not about um, putting people on the spot and or I don't know even uh, sort of creating an embarrassing situation and we actually when we were working with one of the analyst teams we did a sort of, um, like we did a code review process where it was the entire sort of analyst team and a few sort of uh, us from the rap team and we took the code from one of the analysts and we did a code review on the spot uh, with everybody on the call and and it was polite it was constructive and then afterwards the feedback we received from that was that everybody wanted us to do the same with their code like they were very happy for us to share the code and and do this on the spot with other teams as well except for example so i think it's about basically demonstrating that you can improve things for the better, but also not making it sort of like a, a horrible situation for people involved. I don't know if that answers the, the question. Um, th thanks, Helen. I think we've got one more question before we move on, and it's from Chris Beely, and he asks, is there much data in the internal GitLab repos? Um, and would it be possible to remove all the data and move the whole pipeline to data feeds? So for the first, first part of the question, um, we advise against having data on the internal GitLab instance. Um, but one of the reasons we do have an internal GitLab instance is because if there is an accidental sort of, if somebody accidentally loads a CSV and they don't have it in the Git ignore file, for example, then that mistake stays internally at Angus Digital. Um, but the, the general consensus is to not do that. Um, and this, I don't understand the second part of the question. I'm just going to repeat it. I, I'm maybe. Sorry, no, can I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. 
So I'm just wondering, because in my team, we, we, we try and avoid CSVs and spreadsheets and stuff like the plague. So I'm surprised to hear that you've got them in your pipelines. And my, my question is basically, it, it, are you looking to a future where there there are no CSVs, there are no there, there's no where, there's no data to upload? That's what that's what we try and do is avoid it having it in the first place. Yes, um, yes, we're definitely we're definitely the, so in the in the in the background in the works we are there is a project where we're basically trying to uh, focus on replacing CSVs and Excel workbooks and any kind of that format with JSON files. And we are trying to, we're basically working on a solution to integrate that as part of the reproducible analytical pipeline. Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely looking forward to getting rid of CSVs. We, we definitely share the same uh, same feeling on that, on that front. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Helen and Kenneth. That was absolutely great talk. Um, and I was learned so much um, listening to both of you. And I'm going to uh, check out that uh, GitHub repo definitely after the, the talk. Um, just for the purposes of time, I'm going to move on to our second speaker, um, who is Milan Wiedemann. He is a da data scientist slash researcher at the Data Lab at Oxford University. And he will speak about development of tools for querying, tidying, and analyzing data in R. Um, this work took place uh, at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust, um, even though he currently now works at Data Lab at Oxford. So, uh, Milan, um, feel free to share your screen and uh, take the presentation forward. And this is the first talk on uh, the programming language R. Hey, um, I just shared a couple of links in the chat, and I hope that everyone, um, for anyone who wants to follow the presentation, um, and um, a blog post with more information. And I hope that everyone can see my screen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to present uh, this work that um, happened at the NHS uh, Trust in Nottinghamshire, where we um, developed our own tools to work with um, healthcare data. And I'm excited to give a short summary um, of how we tackled some of the challenges that we had in our job um, with um, tools that are available in R. First of all, um, let me show you um, the team that is um, um, also played quite a big role in this because um, as I will highlight later, um, we all have different backgrounds um, and they were crucial for this uh, to work because some of us had um, uh, experience in SQL and some in in R and some had a lot of experience working with the data. So um, it um, at the time it was Laurie and Zoe and me who did a lot of the work, but since um, um, Olu Wasigan and Chris um, have also used the package and tools that we've developed to um, uh, work a bit more repeatable. The challenge that we had is um, uh, that we work, we have a lot of data available that we wanted to work with, but unfortunately it was not in the format always that we um, wanted the data to be to do our analyses. And um, we had to come up with ways of um, reshaping the data, tidying the data, um, and also checking the data, um, which um, was a bit tricky doing it um, or um, the way it was done before. And I want to highlight um, some of some of this in, in a quick example. Well, um, you can imagine that we have different servers with different um, tables and views illustrated by the small squares here. And we want to combine the data. And to make sense of the data, we might have to join different tables in one database and then um, join it to data from another database um, and so on and so forth. And the way this was usually done before was um, lots of single scripts flying around and um, being sent to each other by email. Sometimes um, some things were also on GitHub, but there was no um, reproducible way of um, doing all of this and especially also to share um, one way of um, doing this with other colleagues. Um, and one problem was also that um, if we someone found a bug in the code, that it was tricky to distribute um, a fix across the entire team um, if this wasn't packaged. So 
um, with all the challenges um, uh, that we has, um, we we're trying to find ways that make it easy for us to get data and to tidy data, to analyze and visualize data, to document the code and to test the code. And with the experience um, that we had available in our team, the um, what we came up with is um, writing our packages and some of those packages also had um, Python functions running in the background. Um, but I want to um, just for simplicity only um, talk about the the R packages that we um, we did. So here's a very um, high level overview of some of the packages um, that we did and how they work together. And um, I will only talk about the NOTSHC data package, which um, we developed um, to be able for us to query the data in R um, and um, manipulate the data. And the, so the, the way this, this worked, like we, we didn't come up with most of these things. Um, we used a lot of the tools that are available in our studio to work with um, database um, uh, uh, objects and different databases. But we wrote our own um, little wrapper functions um, using the infrastructure that, that already exists, um, primarily through dbplyr, which um, uh, I think I link at the end of the presentation. And the main workflow that we came up with um, that helped us um, in our daily job was that we always had a function to get a specific data set, then to tidy a specific set, um, data set and um, perform um, um, a subsequent analysis on the data. And what I want to do now is give you two very simple examples um, how this looked like and how that was different to the way um, this was done before. For example, um, one of our tasks um, was to sometimes um, figure out the admission length of um, someone in our system. And that's relatively easy if we're only looking at um, admissions that happen within our region. But it gets a bit trickier when we're also trying to consider admissions that happen outside of the Nottinghamshire region. And um, so we what we would have to do is look at the external spells and internal spells and then figure out a way to add those um, admission days up. And um, that was relatively tricky previously and we could using this structure of the R package that we developed, um, um, write a lot of um, wrappers around this. And in the in the end, all we had to do was one line in the command line, which is calculate admission length for a particular client. Um, and we could specify additional arguments in that function, depending um, um, whether we were interested in maybe a gap of two um, days between the external and the internal admission and get our results. And this was previously could have been, um, I think it was 200 lines of SQL code. And um, we could reduce this to essentially a line of code. Mm. Another example is um, that was relatively complex before, but um, we could automate it. Um, um, quite nicely using the tools that we developed is calculating or figuring out what teams someone is um, seeing at the same time as seeing um, the, um, a particular team. So we could define a primary team, um, a specific time frame, and then see um, all the other teams that individuals who were seeing the primary teams were open to at the same time. And that was relatively tricky before. And um, you can see that here yeah, I'm trying to below um, illustrate how this was done um, using our approach. We would get the referrals um, but, um, for the primary teams, for the secondary teams, and then um, do some joins and get a nice table. 
what we try to do with this, um, to sum this up, um, is we try to automate recurring tasks um, that in a way that it's easy for us to distribute our code across our team, um, come up with a more consistent workflow across all the people that um, do similar tasks and um, try to identify the modules um, that are repeated and um, try to disaggregate data, um, the data side and the analysis side so that we could um, work on data manipulations um, in, in, in different scripts to the analysis, um, um, to the analysis step. All of this is also written up in a little bit more detail in, um, in a blog post. And um, some of the things I spoke about today are also, I think, available on GitHub, but, um, but not everything. Thanks. Thanks, Emilia. That was um, really a uh, great chat, uh, great talk, and was uh, incredibly interesting. So, um, please do put any uh, questions you have in the chat. Um, I'll pick them up. Um, uh, uh, well, um, they're all coming in now. Um, uh, so, what was the reason? So, uh, Sarah Gassi asks, what was the reason to use R instead of Python or another similar programming language? Um, I think um, I, I tried to highlight at the beginning. Uh, there, there's no particular reason. Um, it was our, um, the skills that we had in our team um, came together um, trying to solve the problems that um, we were facing in our team. And I had experience um, developing our packages, um, and we had another person who was um, really good in our team um, with SQL. So that's naturally what happened, I guess. Um, I'm now in a, in a team where um, the uh, with the, the, a similar approach is being done in in Python, so I think um, it was just because that's what we knew. Yeah, I think that's a, something that happen, happens a lot in uh, developer teams. Um, definitely um, share your sentiment. So Chris Bealy pr probably asks quite a quite a challenging question. Um, if you could design not sh data all over again, what would you do differently? Mm. Well, that is a challenging question. I think I'd um, come try to identify, ta break down tasks and come up with a, a specific language. Um, think a bit more about the language um, and build a lower level of not HC data because right now um, it's usually was developed there was a problem and i fixed the problem in r and then um i wrapped it up in a function and throw through that function into the package but um i did it um, one problem after the other and i didn't see all the problems at the beginning um so i think i would see whether there's anything like develop a language um that's um consistent um across problems um, I'm not sure whether that makes sense. Oh yeah, I think that, that definitely makes sense. Um, thanks for the comment. Um, we've got, I'm gonna just take one last question um, and it's from David McDwyer. And he asks, when you build a package, are you able to see how frequently the package has been called? If so, is there some analysis of how frequently it's been used to justify the considerable effort? That's a really good question. Um, I think, um, so there's there's ways to tell how often a package is being downloaded, but that's I think only when it's um, published on CRAN, which is what we haven't done. There's if the if the repo is pro, uh, public, I think, or may, maybe if you have a special GitHub license, you can also see the activity of your repository. Um, but I think. We didn't have any way to tell how often this package is used. And also the good thing about this um, was it was a very small team and like, we knew exactly who was working with it. One thing to keep in mind is that if there's um, this worked well for us because we were a small team, whether this would scale and what else is involved in um, scaling this up. Um, I don't really know. We, we were three or four people working with this package. Um, 
but balancing the effort of writing a package like this and um, whether it's actually worth it um, is a good question that should always be considered, I think. I think that's quite fair. Um, Chris, I'm sorry, I see you have your hand up. Um, just for purposes of time, I'm going to have to kind of move on. Uh, would you just drop the question in the chat and then I can send it to Milan afterwards? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, going on to our final uh, talk of the day, um, it's going to be from Edmund Hack. He's an economic analyst at the Economics and Strategic Analysis team. Um, he uh, is going to talk about drivers of crowding in type one emergency departments, economic econometric model and its implementation in R. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as I said, I'm uh, an economic analyst in the economics and strategic analysis team at a NHS England and NHS Improvement. And I'll be talking about some of the work the team did on looking at the drivers of crowding in type 1 EDs or A&Es. Uh, we refer to them as EDs in this analysis. Just some background about the team. So we work in the office of the uh, Chief Data and Analytics Officer in the CDAO. And our purpose is to support the NHS uh, to deliver better health and care for uh, to citizens and patients through the uh, through the use of data and by providing robust uh, and impactful evidence based analysis. So the team uh, uh, who were on the project with me were Stephen Paling, Svetlana Batrakova, Dimitris Papinis, and Rania Alakra and myself. Um, so. Basically, um, this is our motivation. So the project originally initiated due to the uh, uh, availability of more timely data through faster SUS, uh, and also the shift led by the clinical review of standards, which proposed a, new, uh, a move away from staying times to crowding. We've therefore come up with uh, 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 three crowding metrics in our analysis. Uh, and our, uh, the benefit of our econometric approach is that it allows to allows us to isolate the extent to which individual factors uh, drive crowding. And we've also taken here a whole system approach. So looking at uh, factors pre-hospital, within the ED, rest of hospital, and then at the wider healthcare capacity. So a quick overview on some previous work that the team done, has done. Uh, so the, the team has worked on various projects looking at A&E waiting times, both at the national level and also within uh, individual trusts. So the team has quite a bit of experience in this area. So we have proposed uh, uh, three different metrics here, um, and we also run our models for basically the three acuities. So we split patients by majors, minors, and resource. We've also split the day into six slots, six four-hour slots. Uh, this is due to some previous evidence showing there's uh, uh, different effects throughout the day. Uh, so our three crowding metrics are overall crowding, six hour plus days, and these two are calculated for all three acuities. And then we have cubicle crowding, which is only derived from majors and resource patients. Our overall crowding metric counts the number of patients present in each time, in each time slot for a given acuity. That's irrespective of whether they were discharged later or arrived in an earlier one. As long as they're within the ED, they are counted within that slot. Uh, our next metric is the six hour plus days. So this is counts the number of patients who are staying uh, more than or six hours at the ED. And this is basically just a subset of the overall crowding metric. Finally, we calculate uh, uh, derived cubicle crowding, um, which is uh, basically the number of majors and resource patients per cubicle. And in our analysis here, we've used ECDS data uh, covering uh, March to October. So this uh, shows uh, uh, basically our econom um, econometric model. And again, here using this model allows us to show the effect of each individual variable once we keep uh, the values of the other ones fixed. Uh, so you can see here uh, our different uh, types uh, or different variables that we include, which include, uh, for example, bed occupancy. Uh, we proxy for the uh, ma uh, medical assessment unit, uh, as well as some other patient controls and discharge rates. So what we've used here is a, uh, in our model is a fixed effects panel regression model, and uh, that has the additional benefit that it enables us to account for uh, 
time invariant and observe factors which we can't measure, uh, for example, individual site or trust policies or geographical differences, for example. There were some variables that we would have quite liked to include, such as workforce and such. However, the data quality at the national level was not uh, sufficiently good enough. We uh, developed our code base in R and we have bundled it as a package on the uh, which is uh, uh, available now on the uh, NHS England uh, GitHub account. So whilst we have developed it with uh, data sources available to us at NHS e &I, uh, including SOS data and uh, uh, SITREPS, uh, we've kind of built it in a database agnostic manner, which uh, we hope will enable users across the system uh, to util utilize this on their own data, whether that be at trust or CCG level or in ICSs, uh, provided that the relevant data points are available. We've within our code included uh, basic data cleaning processes and customizable data transformations for our ED attendances and admitted patients. And we've hopefully built it in, in quite a user friendly way uh, so that non proficient R users within the system can take it on. We've also made this really flexible. So whilst we have split, we run uh, six models, six models for the four hour time slots. You can easily change it throughout the day to customize however long uh, or however many slots you'd like at your uh, to investigate at your system. We've also uh, again, whilst we use six hour plus uh, stays, uh, there's a flexibility in that you can choose any uh, amount of time. For example, uh, uh, 12 hours to align with the clinical review of standards might be desirable to look at. Um, all of our code base handles the uh, aggregation from the patient level data up until the uh, panel data structure that we have. So that we, in our analysis, use a daily panel structured data for all uh, sites uh, in uh, type 1 EDs in England. Our code is open source, it's under MIT license. And again, as I've mentioned, it hopefully uh, our aim was to enable other teams at NHS ENI and across the wider system to run our model, but also not only run it, but also build upon it using uh, their own data sources or maybe uh, uh, data points that are relevant to them uh, or that they have better data for. Uh, just on the packages that we've used, so uh, we've based it on uh, data.tables. Uh, so if you haven't used them and you're an R user, uh, they are really quick, really efficient, and very highly recommended. Uh, we've also used fixed disk, uh, which uh, basically allows us to estimate our fixed effects models. Uh, R6, uh, which is basically our, uh, an implementation of object oriented programming uh, for R. And we uh, have the ability to have some plots as well, uh, although some of them uh, are not fully developed yet. Uh, if you want to get started with the with our code, uh, uh, we've got a README on GitHub, uh, which will give you a basic introduction how, and we'll be shortly uh, uploading an example script based upon the stuff that we've done for our work. Uh, we've also are presenting at tomorrow's Anal Analyst X mini huddle in the afternoon. So uh, uh, this is, a, I guess, a sell to uh, come to that if you're interested. Well, we'll, uh, we'll uh, dig a bit deeper or dive a bit deeper into the code that we've developed, developed and getting started with it. Um, yeah, if there's any questions. Yeah, um, thanks, Edmund. Great, really great uh, chat uh, talk. Um, I've got there. In, there's a few questions in the chat. Um, I've got my own question. So you have only talked about type one emergency departments in kind of this work. Uh, could this same analysis be applied for type two and type three? And would there any be would there be barriers to using the same process and the same kind of work you've done for those emergency departments? Thank you. Yeah, so you could easily adapt it to type. Uh, to, you can adapt it to any uh, site, uh, any type you want, uh, provided that the data structure is the same, which if you're using SUS, it will be the same. Uh, so in terms of that, is there's no barriers. Uh, I guess the only barriers would be uh, potentially for type threes, uh, the data quality isn't necessarily as good uh, as what I've heard from colleagues. Great, thank you. Um, and then the second question we have is from Mark Bailey, who asks, so um, have you had any benefits realizations? Has this been used in real life? Uh, so we've only actually, well, we published it about a week, ago, a month ago. Uh, so we haven't actually um, really advertised it big, massively. So this is kind of our first uh, proper advertisement of the uh, uh, stuff that we've built. Um, but in terms of time costs, it's, we haven't spent that much time additionally building it as a package. Rather, we uh, developed it as a package concurrently as to doing the analysis as well. 
Um, great. Well, I've, there seems to be a great opportunity for you in the chat from, again, uh, Mark Bailey's invited you potentially to talk at a conference. So please do take a look at the, at the chat to uh, see that potential opportunity. Um, I've got one more question. Is this code available? Um, it is available in, in, on GitHub um, in some form, or is it still kind of? Yes. Um, it, 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 it is available on GitHub. Uh, so yeah, you can just install it as you would a normal package through DevTools. Uh, we've included some uh, stuff on the uh, how to how to get started uh, very quickly. And yes, we, as I said, we will kind of um, update it with an example script based upon what we've done. Uh, we've just got to uh, make sure we're not sharing anything sensitive there first. Great, thanks, Evan. That was a really great talk. Um, right, so um, now um, I think moving on to our closing remarks. First of all, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I think hopefully today um, we can show that okay, Python guys, and uh, R can coexist in the same uh, space and without any um, huge problems. Um, it was really great to hear all of you speak. So Alex is, and Mary are gonna have some uh, closing remarks. Um, Alex, would you like to uh, speak? Um, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Matea. And um, just want to thank all the speakers again for taking part today. And um, I think Mary is going to be also thanking everybody too later on. Um, just um, so I'm Alex. I am currently the chair for the NHS PyCom community and also um, the co-founder as well, just uh, for those people who are not aware of who I am. Um, just want to share some of the um, information that we'll be publishing in our um, Slack channel or our website for Python community or the NHS PyCom community um, later on. We are currently building a vision document at the moment for the next three to five years, and that's going to be made available to public, e.g. to anybody who wanted to be involved. Um, if you have got any um, comment or any thought that you wanted to take part or you wanted to join or you wanted to contribute to the Python, uh, Python community, please feel free to get in touch with us and then we'll be able to um, have a look at how we can add it to the vision and how we can also set up on the um like to actually help the community to develop of use of open source software and then also how we can actually um help some of the um community members to to make use of the open source software as well um one last thing for myself uh, is that um there are um recording going to be made available on three of the website which is the nhs pycom website nhs r website and also analyst x website or the web space as well with link to further um um or, or the further conversation or further um showcase of any of the materials that you have seen today if you want to get in touch with any of the speaker please get in touch with them and then we'll drop in the detail and then also the contact details in the publication as well mary well thank you alex um there's just a couple of admin things we would love for you guys to do um one is just like a feedback form we want to do more of these and we want to make them like really good and valuable. So if you do have any feedback for us, please do put it in the feedback form, which will be put in the chat. There's also a future speakers form. So if you have open source work, it doesn't have to be Python or R, it could be like any open source technology. Please do fill in that form and hopefully we'll find a space for you to present at one of these events. There's also, this is slightly more urgent, there's also a Google's Women Tech Makers Mentoring Program that's recently got in touch with us, and that's about matching underrepresented groups with tech professionals in Google's network, and Google really, really would welcome like NHS workers to apply. Um, the deadline for that is today, actually, by the end of the day, but the form is super short, so if, if that's something you're interested in, please apply. Um, another thing is that the NHS R, NHS Python community podcast just come out, I think, Chris, is that correct? Um, Chris, would you mind popping a link to that in the chat? Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I just wanted to thank, oh, Chris, did you want to say something on that very quickly? No, that's fine. I was just going to say yes, but no, carry on. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you very much to our speakers, like genuinely, Helen, Ken, Milan, Edmund. Thank you very much. Thank you to also Mattia, Anastasia, Chris Beely. Simon Harry's Alex Chung for organizing all of this. Um, it takes a lot of work, so I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you for everyone for listening, for your attention, and hopefully uh, we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good day. Bye.